When we look at adverse drug reactions in general, not just allergies, but all adverse drug reactions, they account for more than 3% of hospital admissions. Now, drug hypersensitivity reactions in particular compro compromise up to 20% of all adverse drug reactions, and they are reported in about 8% of general population. And that is all drugs, not just antibiotics or not just beta-lactam, but uh, a hypersensitivity reaction to all drugs. Now, the problem is up to 80% of allergies lack descriptions of the reaction. A modern way to look at adverse drug reactions is to think of them as on-target adverse drug reactions and off-target adverse drug reactions. On-target adverse drug reactions are reactions that are essentially based on the mechanism of the action of the drug. So these are things that we actually anticipate. An, ob an obvious example is antibiotics, right? So antibiotics are intended to kill um, microorganisms, but we don't necessarily want them to kill all microorganisms. Specifically, we don't want them to touch the microbiome. Pretty much most antibiotics are associated with C. diff uh, infections, and that is an on-target adverse drug reactions. When it comes to off-target adverse drug reaction, it is useful to think of them non-immunologically mediated and immunologically mediated. Essentially, we need to know if the immune system is involved or immune system is not involved. Now, when the immune system is not involved, we can think of it whether the actual immune cells are involved or not, because some drugs can interact with the receptors on some of the cells, even though the immune, immune system is not activated. An example is when fluoroquinolones interact with the cell receptors on the mast cells, resulting in uh, urticaria, and this is not activating the immune system, but the end result is the mast cells uh, causing urticaria. And that's something that we can see in fluoroquinolones. A non-immune cell receptor uh, mediated uh, example would be aminoglycosides causing nephrotoxicity, in particular acute tubular necrosis. Now, when the immune system is involved, it's good to uh, think of it whether antibodies are mediating it or the T cells are mediating. And to go into more details on this, in general, we like to uh, think of hypersensitivity reactions in four types. So type one, which is the immediate hypersensitivity reaction, and by immediate, we mean within an hour, uh, you know, you will have these reactions. It's mediated by IgE, so immunoglobulin E specifically, and this can manifest in serious things. So anaphylaxis, angioedema, uh, flushing, pruritus, uh, urticaria, and hives. Now type two through type four, these are the delayed hypersensitivity reaction. Uh, so by delayed, it, you know, they're not going to occur uh, within an hour. It will take some time, sometimes even days or weeks. And type two is the IgG mediated cell destruction. And things like hemolytic anemia, neutropenia, petechia, and thrombocytopenia can manifest as a result of this. Type three is IgG mediated uh, immune complex uh, deposition and complement activation. And things like drug fever, serum sickness, and small vessel uh, vasculitis can manifest uh, uh, as a result of this. And last but not least, type four uh, hypersensitivity reaction uh, is T cell mediated. And T cell mediated reactions can be extremely severe. And uh, because of that, we have actually broken type 4 into uh, subtypes. So subtype uh, 4A, B, C, and D. Uh, type 4A specifically involves uh, mac uh, macrophages. And this is things like allergic contact dermatitis. And then uh, for uh, type 4B, which involves eosinophils, it can be things like dress, so that is drug reaction with eosin eosinophilia and systemic symptoms. Type 4C is T-cell cytotoxicity, so these are extremely severe, so uh, Steven-Johnson syndrome, 
uh, as well as uh, toxic epidermal uh, necrolysis. And there is a type 4D which involves neutrophils and this could be uh, acute generalized uh, exanthematous um, postulosis. So when we think of antibody mediated hypersensitivity reaction that includes type 1, type 2 and type 3. So these are all antibody uh, mediated, uh, you know, different antibodies. So for example, type 1 is IgE. And when we think of T cell mediated hypersensitivity reaction, this is specifically uh, type 4. Now let's focus on beta lactam allergy specifically. Now most patients labeled with a beta lactam allergy are actually not allergic. And here are some reasons that they may have been falsely labeled as um, the, uh, beta lactam allergy. So one is that the original reaction might not have been an allergy. So there could be intolerance, for example, nausea, or diarrhea or uh, maybe the infection had caused a reaction so for children they could have had a viral uh, exantheme or a drug infection interaction so if uh, you know uh, there is a skin reaction uh, due to drug infection interaction uh, may have been interpreted as a drug allergy now even if the original reaction uh, were immunologic it might not recur with rechallenge and more importantly, IgE-mediated reactions to beta-lactams can wane over time. So about 80% of patients who are uh, positive for a penicillin skin test and 60% of those with a uh, cephalosporin skin test positive are no longer sensitive over a period of 10 and 5 years uh, respectively. Now, there could be serious consequ unintended consequences of mislabeled allergies. So one is that mislabeling patients with a penicillin allergy can lead to the utilization of second-line antibiotics instead of preferred first-line antibiotics, which are costlier, uh, broader spectrum, and in many instances associated with multiple adverse events. The other thing is that patients are expected to encounter more adverse effects and less optimal outcomes when using second-line antibiotics instead of first-line. And this in turn affects healthcare organizations as the length of stay increases in addition to the cost of care of these patients. Now let's focus on penicillin allergy specifically and by that I mean the class of penicillins, not just penicillin itself. Approximately about 10% of the U.S. population reports a penicillin allergy and about um, you know, 5% of these patients uh, who claim penicillin allergy will actually have a reaction to penicillin. And approximately 95% of patients with a reported penicillin allergy will have a negative penicillin uh, skin test. So if you do the math, about you know, 1% or less of US population actually have a true penicillin allergy. And even if the reaction was a true reaction, keep in mind that IgE antibodies wane over time. So that's important to keep in mind. When we look at the structure of penicillins, of course, there is the beta-lactam ring. There, for penicillin, there's also a second ring fused to the beta-lactam ring. But more importantly, there is a side chain. So there is an R1 side chain, and that, uh, you know, uh, depending on what which penicillin, the R1 uh, side chain will be different. And this will be, me when metabolized, uh, essentially you're going to have all these byproducts that are labeled as major determinant or minor determinant. And it is thought that the similarity between the R side chain as well as the degradation of the ring and the stability of the intermediate products determine the degree of cross-reactivity between beta-lactams. And since the overall structure of penicillins is identical and major and minor determinants from the rings play a potential, potentially significant role, it is generally advised to avoid all penicillins in a severely penicillin allergic patient. And keep in mind that this is for severe uh, penicillin allergy, not something as simple as a rash. Now, when it comes to cross-reactivity, we can think of similar side chains. So penicillin, for example, itself has a side chain that's similar to cefoxetine. So let's say if someone had, um, you know, a non-severe reaction to penicillin, like a rash, they're more likely to also have a similar reaction to cefoxetine. For amoxicillin and ampicillin, their side chain is similar to cephalexin. 
So if they, you know, someone had a uh, non-severe reaction to one of these, they're more likely to have similar reaction to cephalexin. Now, when we look at the big picture, if someone has penicillin allergy, the cross reactivity between penicillins and cephalosporin is actually less than 2%. When it comes to penicillins and carbapenems, it's less than 1%. And to date, actually, the rate of cross-reactivity between astreonam and penicillin is uh, essentially uh, not reported. Now, if someone has cephalosporin allergy, the cross-reactivity between cephalosporins and carbapenems uh, is less than 1%. Now, we have to keep in mind that in general, there is limited data of cross-reactivity when it comes to carbapenems and monobactams because majority of penicillins, that, uh, majority of beta-lactams that we use clinically are penicillins or cephalosporins. So we have much more uh, data for cephalosporins and penicillins, less so for carbapenems and monobactams, which the only one on, in the U.S. is astreonam. Now, what to do when someone has penicillin allergy? Well, the first thing is that you want to evaluate and, uh, you know, investigate to see if it's a true allergy or not. Because if it's not a true allergy, if it's something like intolerance, such as nausea or vomiting, uh, you know, it's safe to use beta-lactams. You know, it's not allergy. Now, when it is a delayed reaction, you want to be very careful because it could potentially be T-cell mediated uh, and that's very severe. So if it's non-severe, something like itching, even if it's delayed, now, you know, it is in general safe to administer cephalosporins, carbapenems, and astreonam. And you don't really have to worry about uh, the side chain. Uh, but if it is a severe infection, uh, such as Steven Johnson syndrome, and these are T-cell mediated, you really want to avoid cephalosporins and carbapenems, regardless of what the side chain looks like. And it is uh, safe to use astreonam. So astreonam will be your only beta-lactam that you can uh, use. Of course, it's safe to use non-beta-lactams. Now, when it comes to immediate reactions, these are within an hour, um, that could be potentially IgE-mediated. For non-severe, it is safe to administer astreonam or carbapenems. If you are to use a cephalosporin because, uh, you know, there's potential for cross-reactivity, uh, you really want to uh, rely on the side chain. So you want to use one that doesn't have a similar side chain. If it is a severe in a reaction like anaphylaxis or angioedema, you really want to avoid, um, you know, uh, cephalosporins and uh, carbapenems um, that have similar side chain because it could potentially lead to anaphylaxis. It is safe to use astreonam. And if you are to use the side chain to decide if it's a cephalosporin that's safe, it has to be in a monitored setting because, uh, you know, there's the risk of anaphylaxis. So if you you, you know, if you're sending the patient home, it's best not to rely on the side chain and avoid it. But if it's in a monitored setting, it's, uh, you know, you can use the side chain. Now, when it comes to cephalosporin allergy, uh, you know, about 1 to 3% of the population reports cephalosporin allergy. So even more rare to have cephalosporin uh, allergy. So less than 1% have true IgE um, reaction. Now with uh, cephalosporin, there are actually two side chains. So there is the R1 side chain. They actually have an R2 side chain. And the second ring is uh, slightly different than the penicillin. The beta-lactam ring is of course identical. Now something that stands out is that cefazolin actually has a unique side chain. Uh, so it has very low cross-reactivity with penicillins. No other beta-lactam has the same cephalosporin uh, side chain. Uh, so that's good. So when it comes to you know deciding uh, similar side chains, we really rely on the R1. Although the R2 side chain may have a role in immunogenicity, uh, you know it is to a lesser extent. So we will we'll focus on similarities of the R1 side chain. Uh, so I have listed some of this is not an uh, you know extensive list. So some of the more commonly used uh, cephalosporins, especially the ones in bold. Uh, so as I mentioned, cefazolin does not have, uh, you know, similar side chain with anything uh, else. Uh, cephalexin, of course, with ampicillin and amoxicillin, uh, as well as penicillin. Cefoxetine with penicillin, uh, you know, cefpodoxime uh, with cefepime and ceftriaxone. Um, so, so, you know, ceftriaxone, um, cefepime and cefpodoxime pretty much uh, share the side chain. So those are, uh, you know, best to avoid 
when uh, one of them uh, is causing a, a, a severe reaction. Uh, ceftolozane has similar side chain with uh, cefpodoxin, ceftriaxone, cefotaxime, and cefepime as well. And lastly, with carbapenem allergy, uh, you know, again, even uh, more rare and really limited data with carbapenem allergy, uh, you know, it's not studied as well. The risk of cross-reactivity between penicillins and carbapenems is less than 1%. Now, because carbapenems are unique in that when we need to use carbapenems, we're dealing with some severe infections that we really need carbapenems. Uh, and so, you know, it will be tough if you really need carbapenem and the reason for not being able to use it is a drug allergy rather than resistance. So based on limited data available, an alternative car carbapenem agent may be cautiously used in patients with reported carbapenem allergy if no other option for treatments are available. What that means is if someone has imipenem allergy and you really need a carbapenem, uh, you know, you can cautiously use meropenem under monitoring.